All right, guys, we are ready for lecture number five in our series here uh, on the book of James. And this one is going to move into kind of the second uh, section of the book, the second kind of big idea that he, uh, that James deals with. That's what we're going to get into for just a minute uh, here during this lecture. Um, so I'm going to go to Word tonight. Um, we want to pick up kind of right where we left off with uh, verse number uh, 13 and think about um, the significance of trials and temptations. Um, section one has dealt from verse two, count it all joy when you face trials of many kinds, has dealt with this idea of temptations since the beginning of the book. And James is going to shift a little bit, but he's still going to deal with some of the same ideas. And so we want to continue to visit those. Uh, I'm going to read 13 through 18 while you kind of get your notes and your, your stuff together there. It says, let no one say to you when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so... James shifts a little bit from trials and now kind of goes back to the idea of temptations. We said back up in verse two, count it all joy when you face trials. Those are things that you really can't control. Uh, this second part of this section is now about things that you have some control over. What is the relationship between testing outside of us and temptations within, according to Warren Wiersbe? He says, if we're not careful, the testing on the outside may become temptation on the inside. When our circumstances are difficult, we may find ourselves complaining against God, questioning his love, and resisting his will. At that point, Satan provides us with an opportunity to escape the difficulty, and that opportunity is a temptation. That is exactly where we're sitting here in April of 2020. Um, so we have this outside trial, this virus, this uh, quarantine that we're in, this opportunity where you guys have lost a semester, you've lost graduation in a normal sense, you haven't lost it completely, but you've lost this opportunity with your friends, juniors have lost this spring sport, I and mean, we, we've, we've lost all this stuff, we're stuck at home. That's a trial, that's outside of us, but now here comes the second mode of that, and it's them tem this temptation. Okay, God doesn't really know what he's doing, God has is, is messed this part of my life up or we're temptation to worry. Oh, how's this gonna work out? What are we gonna do now? How are we gonna bounce back from this? What, what's gonna be the next step? How's this gonna go? And so you start with the trial and then it walks you right into the temptation. And that's why the Holy Spirit puts these sections together. The trial starts and it opens the door for the temptation to come in. You know, we wouldn't be tempted maybe right now to question God if we had been sitting in class all day today. We wouldn't be tempted to worry if everything was going great in our life right now. But since this other thing happened, it, it kind of pushed open that door a little bit. And now we have the opportunity perhaps for a little bit of worry to come up. So I want us to think about temptations a little bit and how to deal with them. Um, the first kind of big step is to look ahead and beware of judgment. Verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. We have to be ready for this. Um, Abraham is tested by a famine in Canaan, but instead of proving God, he runs down to Egypt, and that has long-lasting difficulties. Israel's wandering out in the desert from between the uh, Exodus and the book of Joshua when they get into the Promised Land. Instead of just relying on God, they start to grumble and grop about Moses and all this other stuff. And so again, the testing comes and then the temptation comes in right behind it. Abraham has a chance to believe God and have faith. Instead, he tries to solve it himself and there comes the temptation. Israel can believe God and what he's told them that he's gonna bring them through. Instead, they grumble and wonder, oh, we would have been better off to stay back there in Egypt. God is not the tempter. 
God never tempts us. God will test us sometimes to allow us to learn something about ourselves, but he doesn't tempt us to do evil. He tests us by allowing difficult things to happen to us for our positive response, but he does not tempt us. There is a def there is a difference in those things. He's too holy to tempt, but he does test. Look at this definition. A temptation is an opportunity to do a good thing in the wrong way. Good that you guys want to pass a test. Cheating is a bad thing to do to pass the test. You wanted to have the right end, but you wanted to get there the wrong way. And that always happens in the same four step process that James lays out through the Holy Spirit. So I want you to try to understand why you're tempted and how you're tempted not because it never changes. It's always the same. Okay. Here are the four steps. Verse 14 is step one desire. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own. There's the word desire. Desires are a part of life and they're not bad themselves. Uh, you need to desire to eat. You need to, when you get married, have a sexual desire within your marriage relationship. But when you start trying to satisfy those desires outside of God's method and God's mode, then you're going to be in trouble. Eating is a good thing. Eating too much is gluttony. Scripture says that's bad. Sleeping is normal. Sleeping all day, being lazy is a sinful thing. Um, so you have to figure out how to rein in these desires. Again, you, you don't, I don't want you to think that you need to get rid of your desires. Your desires are not evil. Your desires are good things. They are God given things. They are mandates from God that in the right context will do great things for you. Um, it's good to eat. That's how you stay healthy. It's good to want to achieve certain things. That's drive. That's motivation. But if you get too materialistic, then that desire has become a, a point of contention, a point of a potential to sin in your life. So you have to watch those things. So you have to start with verse 14 is a desire. When do you get tempted? When your desire pulls you too far. When you let your desire run you instead of you controlling your desire for certain things. Again, God gave us certain desires. We let them take us too far. And usually that's the start of a bad thing. And scripture says here in verse 14, that's the start of sin. Here's the second thing that happens. Same verse, verse 14. It says, when a person is tempted, when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Enticed means you have to kind of be talked into it a little bit. Um, drawn away. Uh, pulled away. Uh, this idea of, of drawn away, James uses as a word here I have in your notes, of baiting a trap uh, and enticing a prey, putting a uh, lure on a hook and throwing it out for the fish. The bait is an appeal to your desires. Um, David is up on the rooftop, and Bathsheba, it says, is a beautiful woman. Well, when he allowed that desire, that bait, to pull him closer and then eventually into all sorts of other sin, that's when he messed up. It wasn't the initial look. The initial look, as long as he looks away, he's fine. When he looks again and again and that lust and those things start to build up, that's when sin starts pulling on him. That trap is there, the bait is there, and now it's pulling him away. Uh, Satan tried to do this with Jesus. How did Jesus answer every single time? With the word of God. He said, to turn these stones to bread. Jesus said, man didn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He had a biblical answer to these desires that, again, are biblical desires as long as they're kept where they should be. Cars are really good things as long as they stay on the road. Trains are really good things when they stay on the tracks. But something I hear you guys say a lot is, well, I just want to be free. I want to make my own choices. Well, if you set a train free from those uh, rails that force it to stay on a certain track, then lots of people get hurt. In the meantime, so when we go off on our own track and we get off and do our own thing, that's when people get hurt. That's when something bad takes place in our life because we leave these desires. And here's what we do next. Look at verse 15. It's disobedience. The desire, which is then conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. The emotions, which is the desire, the, the intellect, which is this deception, then gives become the will. Uh, Jesus uses the, uh, the illustration of a child being born and growing up. Desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. The LSD of temptation. Lust brings forth sin, sin brings forth death. LSD, lust, sin, death. When, when these things take over, that's when bad things happen. That's when disobedience takes place. 
when we disobey is when that we follow these other two things. We've allowed these other two things to, to run and, and rule and reign in our lives. We've let these things take over instead of believing what the word of God says. We've let our desire and our, we've talked ourselves into, oh, this is going to be okay. This is going to be fine. This isn't going to be that big a deal. Again, desires are fine. Desires by themselves are fine. But when we let those desires run things and get out of kilter, then we're going to start deceiving ourselves. Well, this isn't that bad. This isn't that big a deal. And then it leads to disobedience. Willpower takes over in the process of sinning. Well, I just don't feel like this. Our will acts regardless of our feelings. When feelings control us, that's when we get vulnerable to temptations. Your will says, I can, I can decide to do this. Your emotions say, well, I feel like doing this. Your emotions are the most shallow part of who you are. They change rapidly. They go all over the place. There'll be a day later in your life, if you get married, where you might say, well, I just don't feel like I'm in love. Well, big deal. Your feelings are, are fickle. Your will says you are in love because it's a choice that you make to love your spouse because it's a vow that you took before God and before others. You choose to do that whether you feel like it or not. Don't trust your feelings or your emotions. They come and go so quickly. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's in your will. Do those things that you know you should do, regardless of how you feel about those things. C.S. Lewis said if we'll quit worrying about how we feel and just love our neighbor like we're supposed to, whether we feel like loving him or not, pretty soon we'll find out that we actually do love him. Our will will be conformed to that of Christ. I'm not going to dwell on this, but verse 15 talks about eventually death comes. Sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. When, when there's deception and there's disobedience, death is never far behind. Disobedience gives birth to death. Obedience gives birth to life. Not always overnight. Sometimes it takes a long time for that to happen. But if you go back to Genesis, what, what happened with Eve? These same four things. She saw the, the tree was good to eat, and she, she began to wonder, did God really say? And so she changed her will. She disobeyed. She believed the lie. What did that lead to? It lead to, led to death, instantaneous spiritual death, and eventually physical death. Go to Joshua chapter 7, when Achan hit, hid the cup in his bag after they weren't supposed to take anything, and he took it. Over and over and over again, we could see this in Scripture. In Acts chapter 5, I preached on last Sunday at Brumley, and, and with Ananias and Sapphira, where they lied to the Holy Spirit. I mean, so, so these steps are, are not new. And when you're tempted, just like when anybody was tempted back in the Garden of Eden or in Joshua's day or in the New Testament, when they're tempted, you're tempted the same way with these same four steps. These same four steps. You have your desires. You have deception. That leads to disobedience. And ultimately, that leads to death. And the same thing, same things happen to you and me as happened to them. It always takes place in exactly the same way. So again, what opens the door? Many times a trial opens the door, a difficulty, and then that leads to an opportunity to be tempted, and Satan knows when to tempt us, and he comes right in, guns blazing, so to speak, and he tempts us. And many times he gets to us because of that. So I want you to be wise. The Bible tells us that we're not to be ignorant of the devices of the devil, but to be wise so that we can stand against them. So I want you guys to be wise in this particular area. So the next video, we'll talk more about temptation as he goes on and tells us how to stand against it. But tonight, I just want you to understand the DNA of temptation. Okay, uh, when you guys will get this video, it's Friday. Woo, fun Friday on the farm. So uh, no homework today. It's our first kind of week back of doing this different style. So I hope you guys are in good shape so far. I uh, hope you've had a good week. Just listen to lectures. Be sure to catch up on anything you haven't done for this week uh, and get everything turned in. Go serve your king. And until I see you again, have a good and godly day.